Well, I think we have a good um, okay. good group, and I think people will be joining us um, as we go. And so, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Um, Daniel, this is uh, represents a lot of our different small groups at the church because um, uh, all the different small groups are joining in various ways. So groups, parts of groups are joining, and then uh, just other folks from the church also are connecting as well. So we have you know, uh, some of our younger adult groups here and um, our family groups, people from our family groups, and then other uh, people involved in the church that are joining. So, and uh, everybody, uh, as you've hopefully read, this is uh, Dr. Daniel Lee. Um, he is a professor at my seminary uh, where I graduated, Fuller. And uh, hopefully you've read his bio a little bit. I mean, he's, you know, um, the a, academic dean at the Center for Asian American Theology and Ministry at Fuller. He's a ordained Presbyterian pastor, assistant professor in theology. So I'm really excited that he can be here sharing with us this week and next week. And it's going to be really great to hear, uh, learn more about Asian American identity and faith, and also how that relates to how we kind of look at systematic racism and, and uh, things like that. So uh, without further ado, why don't I just turn it over to you? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Chris, uh, for inviting me. And I'm just really glad to be here. Uh, I'm going to say a quick prayer for us, and then we'll get started. Uh, gracious and loving God, we thank you for this time. We thank you that we can uh, reflect upon who you are. And everything begins and ends with you. So we want to invite you into this space uh, for you to teach us and for your spirit uh, to um, give us insight into who we are and how uh, how you see us and interact with us. Um, thank you for this time, and uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let me share this presentation, and then I will, I will, um, here we go. Oh, and one thing I just wanted to mention as Dr. Lee gets started is um, we're going to have a Q&A after, and I think, uh, Dr. Lee, would it be best just to give questions on the chat or? Um, yeah. Okay. Why don't you just write a question in the chat, and then, I mean, if you, if you want to write, you know, the questions in the chat while we're going through it, I'm perfectly fine with it. I mean, I won't be able to kind of address everything because I can't even see the screen. But then what I'll do is, you know, I mean, I think the goal is to have, you know, a good chunk of time left over for us to discuss. And, uh, and then we'll kind of go from there, right? Because so, see what it looks like. I think what now our meeting starts, at, ends at 6? Is that what it is? Six, five thirty. Yeah. Is that We're it? Seven forty-two. But yeah. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So yeah, if we have an hour and a half all together, right? Yeah. Right. Sorry. Yeah. It's just, it's like it's my brain's trying to register all the different time changes. Okay. So let me see here. So um, so this is this week, right? Uh, Asian American identity and Christian faith. And what I'm trying to do this week is just kind of help you understand, like, why it matters for our faith. Because just because we're Asian American, and actually Asian American is a complicated thing, but uh, why does it even matter at all? Why are we not just like, just human? Why are we not just Christian? And in what sense does it matter? So we'll talk about that. And then we'll talk about, uh, you know, black lives, systemic racism, and then Asian American discipleship in terms of how it connects together. So we'll talk about race more specifically next week. And then I'll actually kind of talk about how black lives and systemic racism obviously is connected to all the anti, you know, uh, COVID, anti-Asian racism, you know, COVID anti-racism, <laughs> anti-Asian racism that's happening. So I'll talk about that connection because that connection is really important as well. And I think that will help us understand um, how, how, you know, uh, racism, uh, addressing racism against Asian Americans and the uh, uh, and black uh, community kind of disconnected together. So this is actually, um, this is basically, you know, what I do. I help found the Asian American Center. And uh, we've had this thing for, I guess, I've worked on it for like over 10 years. And I helped found it. Uh, Fuller has different ethnic centers. We have an African American center, like we have a, you know, uh, we have a Hispanic center, and we have like a Korean study center, international Korean. But we, I helped found the Asian American center, but the Asian American center is only like five years old because I helped start it. Uh, which actually kind of shows you the fact that Asian American community context is kind of complicated. <laughs> so it took a long time, even at Fuller, and it's at it's LA, right? Because I'm actually from like Southern California, and Fuller is in SoCal. Uh, 
We've had Asian Americans since the 60s, but it took this long for us to kind of figure out the fact that we need a center. But we have different ones. Um, <laughs> Kaylee, I think you might want to mute. Okay. So, and then we have a podcast. If you want to check that out, we have a podcast in multiple seasons. If you want to check that out as well, I want to kind of share a little bit about myself a little bit. Um, this is the fact that I grew up in uh, Northern Virginia. I'm Korean American, second generation or 1.5 generation. My, I came when I was 10. You know, our family immigrated over. Um, I grew up in a, you know, typical uh, evangelical kind of, <laughs> I guess my church was, we were like one of the very few Southern Baptist churches, um, but I ended up kind of becoming more reformed later on. But you know, charismatic Southern Baptist, like I grew up with John Piper, Tim Keller. I, I loved Keller for a long time. And then I think I got into the, you know, kind of reformed theology. So I was like, hey, I want to go deep, deep, deep into reformed theology. So I, you know, I, went to, uh, I went to Princeton Seminary. I mean, mostly just because I went to go into, go into deeper reformed theology, right? And so even then, you know, like my wife got baptized in Redeemer. I actually was like, you know, I spoke at a, um, you know, one of the uh, Redeemer church plants, like Redeemer Jersey church plant, uh, you know, and uh, so very close connection in that sense. Um, I actually didn't even think that Asian American stuff mattered. I was like trying to run away from other stuff. I was like, oh gosh, this (laughs) Asian American or Asian Korean church or Asian American mission. I'm so tired of it. I want to run away from everything. I'm sick of it. I think this gospel centeredness uh, that transcends all differences. That's what we need. Um, that's what I thought uh, until I had a number of kind of uh, kind of spiritual breakthroughs. I think one thing was kind of allowing me to realize the fact that uh, running away from something is not a calling. Because <laughs> you feel like, oh, I'm, I don't like that, so I'm going to run away. I'm like, that's not a calling. It's God calling you something. <laughs> yes, thank you. And then I think the other thing is uh, I realized that um, how my understanding of Reformed theology, as much as I've learned like John Calvin, you know, Martin Luther, I mean, I know, I know, I know Luther pretty well, uh, you know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Karl Barth, I mean, all these different theologians I've studied, I realized these theologians were all doing theology in their own context. Like there was something that they were, they're looking at the situation and trying to figure out where is God, where is God meeting us? And I realized I wasn't really doing that. So it got me on a long journey to kind of, and I kind of tell people that God called me to serve the Asian American church. Like, and I was like kicking and screaming, like, I don't want that. I don't want this thing, you know? Um, and so it's been a long journey. And, uh, I, you know, I mean, now I actually do like, you know, I do diversity work, even at Fuller. I'm, I'm actually the chair of diversity council at Fuller Seminary. Where, so I help kind of coordinate how we think about diversity. I mean, it's typically like a black person who does diversity, but I'm the Asian American person who does this thing. So I do a lot of racial work and things like that. And even that, like I didn't go through any Asian American studies when I was in college, like zero. Like I didn't even, I thought that, I thought that was weird. The fact that people are studying Asian American studies. I mean, I think some of you guys might have known if you went through Asian American studies, you probably know more than I did when I was like, you know, like, I don't know, 10 years ago or whatever. Um, I think a lot of things I talk about, and especially next week, and I talk about all the racial dynamics, all the stuff, I did not learn it before. It's not like I learned some progressive education and I'm applying it. I was just, you know, I'm, I would say I'm, I'm, I'm actually relatively like theologically pretty conservative because I'm just historically reformed, right? But I'm just trying to understand what my experience is. And then because of that, I kind of pulled and found all these resources and said, women, but other, other resources, right? I was like, what is happening to me as I'm doing this work? And I said, oh, it's this. Oh, it's this. And I found these things. And then I did a lot more research in the last 10 years. So that's my story. I think I, it's, it's important for you to understand that because I think sometimes when people hear me or when they kind of, I don't know, follow my Facebook, they're like, why is he like this? It's some, you know, it's, I think sometimes people think I got like some radical, you know, <laughs> like uh, college education or something or seminary education. I'm like, it's literally none of those things. So much of what I learned is on the job. I'm like, what is happening? And how do I understand this thing? So that's a lot of what I'm going to be talking about. Just this is all the stuff I've learned and I've researched throughout my, uh, throughout my background. So it's a little bit about me. And what I always tell people is you always start with God. What is God like? Who is God? That's the foundation of all theological reflection, right? So this is what I say. I mean, when you think about it, and, uh, you know, I teach systemic theology, and I try to really remind people because this is actually, this idea 
of God being a God of covenant, for example, it does, it's not really clear. Like, you know, uh, what does it mean to think God is a God of covenant? It basically means that God is, when God reveals who God is, God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Like, God enters history and is part of history, which is really odd, right? And you're like, well, what can it be? Well, God could just be an abstract idea, abstract, philosoph abstract philosophical idea that doesn't really care about history at all. But that's not the God of history, and the God, God of scripture. God enters time and space, which is really, really profound. That means history matters. Um, and I'll talk about exactly how that matters. But this point already tells you the fact that God is actually a living God that encounters Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even though God's a living God, an, an eternal God, in a slightly different way, because God actually is a person interacting with you. And, uh, you know, and, and, I mean, there's so much more to go, go about this thing, but I think uh, the basic thing is that in a covenant, God says, I am your God, and you are my people. So it goes both ways, right? And God says, I am actually seeing you, and I want you to see me. I am responding to you and talking to you and who you are actually matters in the same way that who I matter. So it's kind of reciprocal and that, that's really, really important to understand. And the second thing is that God, God's the God of creation. You know, we talk about God's the God of creation and God, God enters at creation, like, like, you know, in, the, in who God is through the incarnation, right? Like that God becomes part of creation, which is a really bizarre idea. And I think other religions, they don't talk, they don't talk that way. <laughs> I mean, in terms of like the one universal God entering uh, creation, right? Uh, it's not like, a, it's not like a, a, a timeless abstract idea. No, God enters and God takes on a particular body in the person of Jesus Christ. And actually, that's why the resurrection matters so much. And that's one of the reasons why our bodies matter, right? Because we believe in the resurrection of the body. We don't believe in the fact that we all float in space, we believe the fact that we will resurrect. And that's one of the reasons why I think people didn't want to, you know, um, cremate people, right? Like, oh, cremation is not, not biblical. I mean, I don't necessarily think that that actually necessarily matters, but for the longest time, Christians didn't want to cremate because they're like, well, we sh that's what pagans do. We actually buy, you know, bury the body as whole because we don't, we want them to resurrect. So even if you don't do that practice, I think the idea is the fact that creation and our embodiedness, right? Who we are as people, in our whole physical being, it actually matters because that's how interact, God interacts with us. And then the third thing is that God's got a kingdom. You know, like when God comes, he's, you know, and, and Jesus talks about the kingdom of God is here, the rule of God is here. Um, um, God's saying there actually is a power dynamic and actually it's inherently political. As you know, like in the first century, if you said Jesus is Lord, that would have been a fundamentally or inherently political because there is a Lord. There is a political Lord. And the question is, why would you say Jesus is Lord? So that there, actually in Greek, I mean, the idea of like a Lord and the and, uh, idea of things being political is actually part of the dynamic, even though it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, like they're, they're actually uh, thinking about their work in a purely political way. It has political ramifications, just like it has every other sociological, uh, physical, spiritual ramifications as well, right? Because Christ is talking about ruling over all of who we are. So a bit abstract, but I'll get to kind of more, more concretely what we're talking about. It basically means this, the fact that where we are matters. And if you think about it, it's really odd the fact that Jesus' call upon Esther upon Paul, Esther, like during the Persian Empire, you know, as this kind of adopted kind of queen, right? Um, as Paul in this kind of bicultural kind of cosmopolitan place and during Roman Empire, and then Moses during the Egyptian Empire, right? Or oh, Ruth in the, in the midst of like, you know, Philistines and other, other dynamics that are happening. I mean, these, the God's encounter with these people is not interchangeable. It's not like, oh, well, Esther, your, your, uh, you know, your identity lies in me, so just you know, enjoy that. It's not like that. Like all throughout the Bible, God's encountering people and seeing where they are. So the call upon God's life, like people's lives are very, very particular. And so I think one way of thinking about it is the fact that God's a living God. And God says, I see you, Esther. I see where you are. And and so another way of talking about it is that, you know, we want the gospel to all, all corners of our being. Like God gives us a particular healing for where we're hurting. 
particular transformation and a particular calling. And this is, whether it be in, in, in the Bible, whether it be church history, whether it be everybody globally around the world, God interacts with people. Now, it is one God, right? It's the one God for everybody. But how that God interacts with different people is different because that's God actually sees you. Like, I mean, I have three daughters and uh, I don't interact with all three daughters the same way. I mean, not only because, <laughs> it's not because I'm, I have favorites, because I actually see what they are, right? Who they are. And I know, that, I know that different kids have different challenges. So if I treated them all same, it really wouldn't be fair because I'm erasing their particular history. So that's actually, I think, one way of thinking about why just anybody, who anybody is matters, right? So um, uh, that's the first part right? in terms of why does who we are matter to God? Well, it turns out that's the kind of God we have. And sometimes because of, actually, mostly because of, uh, I think, modernity and, and the influence of enlightenment, we've kind of made the gospel in a very abstract, universal thing, but that's not how the Bible talks. It's actually kind of more of a distortion put upon the Bible to make it more of like a, you know, general ethic for everybody. But that's actually more of a distortion, so we're trying to recover what the Bible is talking about in this, in this kind of concrete, kind of hysteric, uh, historical sense. Right, so given that, uh, second part. So talking about, well, that's all, if we say that's all great, if you can actually have questions about that. If we say that's all great, uh, the question is, is there any particular thing like that, that actually is there for Asian Americans, right? Because if, if there's no particular things about Asian Americans and the fact that, well, I mean, is there actually that much difference between people? If it's not, there's not that much difference, why does it even matter? Uh, let me talk about, what does it mean to be Asian American? Because as you know, Asian American is like one of the most non cisco categories in one sense. It's so diverse. Uh, Asian Americans don't share anything. We don't share a language. Like, it's not like Hispanic culture. I mean, even, even them, it's not like they all share the same language, but at least they share like Spanish or Portuguese at least. But we don't share that. We don't share skin color, right? Because you know, as you know, Asian Americans include like Southeast Asians, South Asians. I mean, some of them are brown, right? Very dark. Um, we don't share that. So what does it mean to lump all these people together, especially when Asia is a big place, right? Um, that's basically what we're trying to get to. And uh, uh, let's kind of, kind of break it down a little bit in terms of what that really means. I, I want to kind of start by thinking about this experience. Let's think about like the language we use and the Asian American experience. Uh, I think a lot of people think, well, we have our experience, we have the language, and the language helps us kind of, uh, you know, translate what's, uh, what our experience is like. The only thing is, is that language doesn't just translate it, it kind of helps us to name it. It's actually, language not only gives us a, a, a description, it actually has like an interpretive function, it actually has a constructive function, right? Because um, how your brain works is that uh, the lang if your experience gets filtered and interacts with the language concepts you have, and then you understand yourself. It's not like, I just experience everything and then my brain kind of just says, okay, that's what it is. What, what I'm trying to say is this, as Asian Americans, we have kind of like a ling, uh, language limitation or, or like a literacy limitation. Um, if you can think of it this way, because basically our educational system is so white normative, right? And it doesn't mean that it doesn't benefit us. It's just that because it's so white normative, it, it, I generally tell people like the, that, Asian Americans, um, we have like a, like a, if you're not tr trained in terms of Asian American studies or Asian American history, we almost have like a elementary school level or even a kindergarten level uh, education in terms of describing the Asian American side, right? Asian side of our, our, our existence. Like the white normative side and the fact that we kind of publicly, how we can kind of function. Yeah, we know how to articulate that, but because we read so much, uh, you know, Western philosophy, which is all good, right? It's helpful, like Western spiritual life, all the white spiritual life, which is all beneficial to a degree. But when it comes to Asian specific stuff, Asian American specific stuff, we don't really have a language for that, right? Like I remember growing up and, you know, I was like, I would say, oh, you know, uh, that pastor is very Korean. And Korean meant something pejorative, like, oh, it's, you know, that pastor, he's not very good, he's Korean. And I was like, after what, and I would say, oh, that person's very Americanized, which is a good thing. 
or my friend, a pastor, who said he grew up saying uh, Chinese. Oh, it's very Chinesey. You know, like my grandma is very Chinesey. He kind of, she kind of like smells like tiger bomb and bitter, some mushrooms and just <laughs> whatever, right? Like I, that's all Chinese stuff. I don't want that, right? Uh, I think it, that's basically how, we, and so that the level of articulation about our Asian American experience can be very, very limited. Like, for example, like in terms of uh, Asian American history or in terms of talking about Asian heritage, it's like, well, how do we talk about that? Maybe we have some sense of like, well, that's Taoism or whatever. That's actually Confucianism. But even that, I mean, Confucianism is like, a, like over 2,000 years old. So what does it really mean to know that, right? Whereas on the other side, when we talk about Western philosophy, if you actually got a decent education, you might know about Kant, you might know about Enlightenment, you might know about like Gadamer, or like you might know about, you know, like French, you know, uh, deconstructionists or whatever. You, you learn about this thing. I'm saying the Asian American experience we don't learn about. Or even the, the racial experience, a lot of the racial experience ends up being like just black. So when we talk about Asian American racial experience, it's very difficult to understand that. Now, some of it that might be, because there's a lot more books now, a lot more stuff, but getting formally trained for it is actually not what's happening. Uh, one of the Asian American scholars, uh, I think Shirley, I can't remember, whatever, what, I can't remember her last name, but she talks about one of the failures of Asian American studies is the fact that we have an impact at the secondary education. Like it's not there. So we have a situation, we have invisible history. Our history is erased, right? We don't know about, you know, uh, uh, the particulars of uh, Asian American activism. We don't know about all the Asian American uh, um, significant like, migration history uh we don't you know i mean a lot of people i mean hopefully you know, some of you might know who vincent chen is but a lot of people have no idea who vincent chen is right uh who was uh, who was kind of murdered in, in detroit in 1982 or you know who people don't understand the fact that uh, larry young right so who's a filipino american activist he actually was was instrumental in getting cesar chavez to kind of uh, start up the to that farm workers kind of you know protest and movement we don't we don't know about these things the first the fact that the uh chinese exclusion act of 1882 is one of the one of the one of the first immigration laws ever right and it was actually a racist law right so and of course it was direct against against chinese and later on toward all asians i mean these kind of things the first concentration camp was against and actually the only concentration camp well, actually, maybe we can argue that point. But what the first concentration camp, this is what FDR called that. He called them concentration camps. Uh, against uh, American citizens was against Japanese Americans, right, during World War II. So if we don't know history and we don't know about these things, it's, we can't really situate ourselves. So what I tell people is that how do we learn about this history? How do we learn about who we are as Asian Americans? And so this, I teach a whole class on this, just this, right? And so I say, look, Asian Americans are like fish in water. We have no idea what's in water. And so we're trying to figure out what the heck's going on and who we are. And we're very complicated, but you don't ask a fish what the house of water is like. So I, what I try to tell people is like, we need some language to once get language, right? Literacy, cultural literacy to, to be able to describe what our, what our problems are, what our pains are. And actually in terms of even what I'm giving to God, right? So in that sense, uh, we, I developed this thing called the, uh, the Asian American Quadrilateral. And uh, basically what it is, is like thinking about the Asian American experience using four meta categories, right? Um, these are all categories that all of us share. If you're Asian American, all of us share this thing. We just share it differently. Like how we share it, how we experience it is very different, but all of us experience it. And the, all the terms out there kind of fit into these bins. So if you think about these four things as bins, you can kind of take all these different ideas that are there in our experience, like modern minority or whatever, right? You know, uh, or, you know I, uh, yellow apparel or, or internalized racism or whatever. You can kind of fit it into these bins and kind of organize all the different aspects of what the Asian American experience looks like. And so we call this the Asian American quadrilateral. And this is a way in which we organize uh, the Asian American experience. So I went super fast, but one of the reasons I wanted to do this thing was to kind of, was to kind of like help you digest a little bit and have, uh, have Q and A and then for us to kind of process it. So I'm gonna get out of this video.
I'm in this presentation mode, and then I'm going to, uh, wait a minute. yeah, and then I'm going to sit there and kind of interact with you guys. And then, you know, I, I, and then I can kind of refer to different videos if I need to. So I think that's what the idea is. The first part is the fact that, look, this is who God is, right? And if you, I, I think for, for the longest time, um, people, and actually this happens, if you, and the researchers show how during the enlightenment, like for example, Immanuel Kant was talking about the fact that they wanted to kind of reduce God to more of like a reason, uh, uh, like an ethical principle. So after a while, you kind of made God into kind of an abstract idea that's universalized. And then they kind of erased the Jewish people, erased all these different particulars, and then it, God wasn't really part of history anymore. That's basically kind of what winds up happening. So we're trying to recover that. And when you do, you realize, oh, this is how God's always been. And then the second part is saying, this is basically what the Asian American experience looks like. So hopefully you can use this idea to describe where you are, right? And of course, when we talk about the Asian American quadrilateral, I generally tell people, that's because we navigate that so differently. Like you just navigate it very different than I do, depending on what kind of, uh, you know, gender, ethnicity, uh, generation. I mean, I don't know what generation some of you are, but so, you know, if you're like fifth generation Japanese American, you just think about the world very differently, right? Especially if you grew up in like SoCal. I mean, this is, you just have such long history, as opposed to if you're like a recent immigrant from like Hong Kong, you're, you're gonna think about it very differently as well. Um, or if, or you know, if you're like a first generation, uh, you know, grandma living in like uh, Louisiana, you would think about the world very differently. And so all those three, four things I talked about are, are navigating, you know, are organized in a very different way. And so once again, you would give those things to God and find a way to kind of describe your life and your challenges, your pains, your struggles, and your calling using those terms. And so that's, this is just, how do we have some categories before we can kind of talk about, uh, we can talk about, uh, uh, you know, any particular issues, whether it be about a spiritual faith, whether it be engaging the world, I mean, with, whether it be elections or whether it be like race relations or whatever, like this is trying to understand where you are and why you see things that way, or in terms of why people interact with you that way, right? Because people see you in a particular way as well. All right, so uh, if you, uh, let's start with this. I mean, there might be just initial, thoughts like okay i don't know what that was about you can actually ask those questions or you can be like yeah that part i find interesting so anything anything of interest or any clarification questions um I, that would be beneficial so if it's more of like i find this interesting it can be just a short comment like oh this is actually what i found to be really interesting so i would love to kind of hear feedback from you so i can kind of describe things and kind of uh, talk about those things and further explain with you or whatever questions you have because my presentation is done. I, I think it would be probably helpful to explain the quadrilang quadrangle a bit more and help them under, uh, help understand that in our experience. Kind of how do, how do we understand those four things in our experience? Yeah, okay, let's, let's think about this. Um, have, have if any of you read the book, uh, Following Jesus Without Destroying Your Parents? No, okay. Um, let's think about it this way. When you, like, I, uh, there's a book called um, Gospel, Gospel for Life or something like that. It's actually like a Tim Keller, like, you know, discipleship book. Okay, well, I, I think it's great. What I tell people is that Tim Keller, um, this is one of the reasons where I said, as much as I've been influenced by Tim Keller, I'm like, there's something here that I'm, I'm actually missing because <laughs> There's this is one one exa one um, one sermon where where Tim's like, and I've I've listened to like Tim Keller for like ten years, right? It's like a decade. I actually know him really well, like in terms of like what his theology looks like. And uh, he was this is one example. He was, you know what? Don't you know people? And you know, as you know, Redeemer is like fifty percent Asian American. He goes, uh, don't you know people? God is a father and not a boss. He can't fire you. And I was like. Tim, do you know your congregation? Like, they're 50% Asian American. Like, I think sometimes my boss is more fair than my dad. I mean, it's, you know, father is kind of tricky in Asian American context, right? It's not like, oh, my father, because I know people who actually been disowned by, God, by, by father, right? By their dad. So I'm like, it's not that tricky. It's not like, oh, yeah, 
of course, father's so much more fair, unconditional love, whereas boss is not. I'm like, I can take my boss to HR, but I can't take my father to HR. So what do I do, right? I'm just saying there's something here particular. Now, does that mean the fact that all of us, of course, all of us think about God as father, but the question is, there's a particular way in which we experience what father means. So does, does uh, when we talk about this, and how does it filter out? So let's talk about it from a quadrilateral perspective. It's like, well, there are cultural heritage about what, what ideas of what, what, what fatherhood's like, right? And it goes deep. It's, it goes like, you know, hundreds of years, right? Uh, in certain contexts, in terms of our heritage. So heritage. So it can be like, well, are we thinking about fatherhood in a particular way because of our heritage? Or is it because we have, we've experienced kind of structural racism in terms of so many stuff and in terms of how racism impacts us that we think of, when we think about our father, especially if you watch so much of the news and what, how we perceive Asianness to be, you can be like, well, I mean, you know, my dad's a typical Chinese dad. Like, I mean, and, and all the stereotypes that you absorb from the media ends up becoming part of your view. For example, I was talking to this one, one woman and she said, you know, uh, a couple of years ago, there was Steve Harvey. You know, Steve Harvey is, he's like, he was making this, he was making this joke about uh, um, Asian men dating white women. Anybody, anybody remember this thing? It was like a big joke, like, and it was like, it kind of blew up and people are really upset about it. And he was like, you know, uh, you know, why would, why would anybody date Asian men, he said. And he goes, you know, I don't, I don't eat what I can't pronounce. And I don't, you know, I don't think anybody should date Asian men, right? So the audience was laughing and all this different stuff. And we're like, wow, that's really racist. And people are really offended by it. And the Asian American one who watched it said, oh, I mean, I don't like, this is Asian American woman. Of course, I don't like Asian woman, Asian men either. And uh, we're like, well, let's think about this. Why? And she goes, well, they're not attractive. And I was like, well, let's think, let's break this down a little bit. Uh, do you think your images of Asian men are just purely yours? I said, how many, how many romantic comedies have you, see, have you watched that actually have an Asian American lead? Like Asian American D, that you're like, oh, it, it, he's very attractive. He's like, well, maybe this one guy, you know, and it turns out that the actor was like half Asian. And I was like, that's it. And I was like, okay, have, how many Asian American, or how many romantic comedies or movies you've seen where the Asian character is like this a butt of jokes, right? It's like, oh, it's like, so how, why would you want? It's like, oh, I can count a couple, right? A couple where I'm like, oh, yeah, they're just like, you know, uh, Ken Jeong, kind of like, oh, he's just some freak, right? Just in terms of what the character is. And I was like, okay, let's think about this. When you watch this so often, it actually, do you think it actually it doesn't impact you? Because you're seeing this on a regular basis. I watch so much, so many romantic comedies because my wife loves romantic comedies. I'm not like a rom-com fan, but I've seen a lot of them. And what's interesting in rom-com is that not all the characters are attractive per se. They're, they're, uh, story and their character and makes them attractive, right? It's actually how they're written. And in that sense, that kind of impacts how we see the world, right? So, and all, so what I'm saying is whether it be talking about some kind, somebody, some Asian American person you want to date, or whether it be how we think about our parents, these things in terms of how, what's happening with American culture impacting us, whether it be how, how, um, how our, race, our experience is kind of racialized or how we are, it's part of the my, you know, migration experience as immigrants, all that kind of interacts with who we are. And it impacts how we see God, impacts how we, how we think about discipleship, it impacts things like, like Black Lives Matter, like why are we thinking about it this way and not other ways. So hopefully that kind of gives you some idea. I mean, out of the, out of the four, you might think about like, um, uh, you might ask like, what part of it is, uh, are you most familiar with? And what part of it is the most troubling? You can kind of think of it that way as well. Man, I have a question here. It says, instead of saying we're all human or all Christians. So yeah, like, so yeah. No, that was, that was a comment. Right, right, there's a comment. Yeah, so I mean, so I tell people, yeah, we're all united in Christ, right? But I think what we've done, and there's a lot of research on this, especially Asian Americans, because sometimes as Asian American, our identities just ends up being like a liability. Like it's just feel like, well, do we, 
do we gain anything by this? Thing? It's just kind of there, right? So uh, there's a lot. Of Look, here's your Asian American identity is kind of problematic, but you know what? Now you're a child of God. So rather than being Chinese American, you are now a child of God. They kind of exchange this thing for this, right? When in fact, when in fact, you resurrect in your bodies. And Revelation says the fact that there's actually distinctions upon people. It's part of who we are, right? There's actually no generic humanity that we kind of end up being. Otherwise, it wouldn't talk about people and, and nations or and all this different stuff in Revelation because those distinctions continue on, right? So the question is, what do you do with these things, right? Um, I mean, I tell people like, my goal as, as a professor is not to, um, like, I'm not your mother. Or I'm not your grandmother and say, oh, you know, like uh, Jillian, like, you know, like, or Sylvia, you're like, you know, is your ethnicity Chinese, Sylvia? Okay. So, like, you know, I, I grew up thinking, like, my mom saying, okay, look, look in the mirror, you're Korean. Right? So, my goal is not to say, look, look, Sylvia, that's who you really are, you're Korean. I mean, you're, you're Chinese, and, you know, God's saying you're Chinese. That's not what I'm saying. Like, I'm saying, what does it mean to allow God to come and bring God's pe healing, peace, and reconciliation to all aspects of who we are? And so the question is, how do you bring this side and this side and this side? And sometimes we don't even own certain parts of ourselves. Like we don't know what to do with this side. Like I don't know how the gospel connects to this side. So the question is, how do you bring all of who we are? Now, at the end of this journey, it doesn't mean that, oh, you know, that means you're gonna love all these aspects of being Chinese. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that there's actually a sense of like peace and healing and all these things that part of who you are, you're able to use for God's kingdom, which is actually slightly different than what my mom said, which is actually no matter what, you're gonna be Korean, right? That's actually fundamentally who you are. And I'm like, that's not what it is. It's more like, how do we bring all of ourselves and have a full transformation of every, every aspect of who we are? Does that make sense? All right, so uh, questions, thoughts, I, you know, I can, I can talk about different things, but I mean, I mean, the unpacking the quadrilateral is a lot because that's part of the question, right? Part of the, question, part of the problem in terms of how do you unpack this thing? Because we can't describe all aspects of who we are because we have, the, we lack the language. But for, you, for me to teach it to you, is it, it'll take like, you know, I, mean, I teach a whole class on this, right? So it's the idea of like heritage, would it be like, hey, you know, like none of us are trying to be, confusion or like you know buddhist or whatever but it's part of part of what we consider to be like my korean values right and the question is how do you articulate that in a more precise way than just saying koreanness or chineseness or taiwaneseness right or thai-ness or whatever in terms of migration being what does it mean the fact that when we migrate over it actually impacts us in a certain way so in what sense is god in the midst of that in what sense is there pains and hurts that god wants to heal right in terms of american culture is talking about the fact that America, you know, um, has a particular way of kind of representing us, I mean, it's a, a multiple aspects of it, representing who we are. And so does representation impact how we think about ourselves and what does it mean for us to be transformed with our minds in terms of that? And race relations means the fact that we kind of somehow get stuck in the middle and we are of black and white. And that we also have a particular experience of in our racialized bodies, the fact that even though I'm Korean American, in certain spaces, they say, well, of course, you're just Asian American. I'm like, what does it mean the fact that you're Asian American? So that's what we're talking about and having the words to describe what our issues are at all. I have a question. Yeah, um, Sylvia, go ahead. I'm like somewhat a little bit more familiar with Asian American studies because I did some like some classes in school. Yeah. Um, but I guess like it's more of like for your experience, how has it been kind of unpacking the role, I guess, your Asian American identity play into Christianity, given that, like, I think a lot of, like, I mean, this is a really broad stroke, but, like, narratives of, about how Christianity got to Asia and, like, is very, you know, like, you know, white, like, yeah, yeah. Christians and stuff. And, like, have you found that, like, I'm, I, I, I like to believe that, you know, their culture can be separated from the message of God. But personally, how have you find that, like, kind of reconcile, you know, looking at race relations and, like, what it meant when that faith was kind of imposed onto the Asian community? Whether yeah. that, you know. that's, a, that's a great question, right? So 
um, I mean, so much of the early missionaries, they really couldn't distinguish the Christian message from Western civilization, right? So being Christian meant being Western. Um, obviously, I think in, in missiology, because you know, I'm training missiology as well, it's developed over the years and they realized, okay, this is actually not very helpful because now people thought being Christian was being like almost European. And so that actually ended up being something that uh, people try to kind of tease out, right? So how do you do this thing? Um, I would say this, I would say, like, for example, I talk about like the fact that I have a, I have a Buddhist confusion, like Taoist, like heritage, cultural heritage, because it's literally embedded in my culture, right? And people are like, well, don't you want to get rid of those things? Because they're pagan. And I was like, yeah, I thought the same thing. I, was, I thought, I was like, well, I want to I get rid of myself of all these pagan non-Christian influences. And what I realized is that it's literally impossible. It's like a sweater. If I just pull this out, there's actually nothing there. The sweater itself is a thing, right? Unless, I, it's not like I'm, if I get rid of these things, I'm going to be white. Uh, I think what I realized by looking at somebody like uh, C.S. Lewis or uh, Tolkien, which I love, I love both those people, right? I was like, wait a minute, what are they doing? Because Tolkien, for example, Lord of the Rings, I don't know if you read it. I'm like, it's a very pagan book. It's actually a Nordic pagan religion. That's basically what that is. What he's doing is figuring out, well, this is part of who he is to some degree. And he's like, how do I interact with this thing in such a way so that I allow these things to be transformed by the gospel. So he writes Lord of the Rings, and a lot of it's- What is that thing? You know. Yeah, I think you might want to mute. <laughs> that Zoom thing on Asian American identity. Yeah. Oh, there you go, okay. <laughs> so I, I think what I realized, you can do something like that, right? In the same way, you, like, you know, uh, Chronicles of Narnia, once again, a very pagan book, like, because all the imagination, he's talking about Nordic religions and, and Nordic, like, you know, like a Nordic myth in a sense, right? And he's saying, what does it mean to kind of think about this, who God is in the midst of this language? So I'm saying, we can do the same thing with that Asian, Asian heritage, which is actually one area, right? Thinking about it that way. What does it mean to kind of imagine and interact with our, our cultural heritage, right? And not over all of us interact with cultural heritage in the same way, but that's one example. What does it mean to kind of interact with that? Now there's colonial stuff and other stuff that we kind of have to tease out as well but that'd be one aspect of this very complicated thing. I mean, I think it's part of the thing that we have to kind of tease out is that so much of our missionary uh, endeavors were so complicit with colonial kind of powers that like, it's like, and I think it's possible to kind of at least tease it out of it, but obviously they're just all totally intertwined. Like, you know, how do you, you know, how do you, how do you think about what the gospel is without thinking about like a Western, uh, European colonial influence. I think it's possible, but it is, it is a challenge that we have to recognize the fact that it's there. I, I hope that kind of gets to some of the questions we're talking about, right? I mean, it's not true the fact that, oh, missionaries were perfect everywhere. I mean, it's, it's really, you know, they're complicit in so many different ways of kind of uh, taking over the world for, for a Western empire, so imperialism. So any thoughts, maybe like, so you may, okay, uh, let me see here. Oh yeah, so uh, I guess it's, is it Ralph? Is that how you pronounce it? <laughs> Ralph. Ralph. Ralph, so yeah, Ralph. can you drop some resources? Ralph? Like Raphael, yeah, like yeah. Ralph. Ralph, yes, Raphael. Uh, can you drop some resources for us? Know our history better? Yes, I can do that. I can definitely drop some, because that'll help you a lot. Like, there, so all of us have multiple histories, right? So all of us, are in one sense kind of racially Asian Americans, and we have our ethnic identities as well. So there's multiple histories. Like I have my history, family history that goes back to like, you know, Korea, Korean War, whatever. But I also accept Asian American history, which basically inclu includes like Japanese Americans and Chinese Americans, which is kind of odd. But it's part of navigating this world because if you don't understand the Asian American history, you'll be like, what is happening? For example, Obama, as you know, is like second generation. I mean, he's like, he's barely second generation because his parent was like, his father was like an international student and he was gone. He was not even an immigrant, right? So he's like navigating the world and he realizes, wait a minute, in order for me to understand the world and where I fit into it, I realize to some degree, in one sense, I am black. In another sense, I have this, you know, I have this Kenyan influence, a Kenyan heritage. So he kind of, he kind of understands and kind of realizes the fact that he has kind of adopted or, or be, become conscious of it. And so he, he kind of owns that, right? And to some degree, that's what I'm saying. How do we own this thing? Because it's already part of our experience. How do we own it? 
so that we can actually give it to God to understand what's happening. If we don't own it, you'll be like, I don't know why this experience. Like when I just out like all the microaggressions that Asian American experience, you'll be like, if you live in like an Asian American bubble, then you don't experience some of those things. But when you go to work or when you interact with different places, you get a lot of like, you know, everyday racism. So yeah, in that sense, um, there is a heritage part of it. Like, you know, for example, like Ralph, I don't know, Ralph, what is, what is your ethnic heritage? Where is Ralph? Hey, sorry, I was um, getting raided from the shower. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm Filipino American. Yeah, so if you're Filipino American, right? So there's actually, I mean, Filipino American is really, really, really interesting because I mean, Philippines is part of the U.S., which a lot of people forget about. I mean, people just forget about imperial history. And so that, there is this particular thing, right? So, I mean, one of the great, a really, really helpful book is, uh, is wait, where is it? I think I was just literally, oh, yeah. Like, this is actually really, really helpful, right? <laughs> I just happen to have it on my desk, right? It's called uh, Brown Skins and, and White Minds, right? And it kind of gives a lot of history. It's a psychology book. It gives a lot of history as well right so that kind of gives you an idea because you're like because without history you you really can't understand where you are and how you got there right so you, you kind of understand it and then what has how has it impacted your life and how has it impacted your mindset and then the question is how do you how do you can now connect bring these things up to god right i mean what i'm talking about at this moment is just being able to identify what your life is like because if you can't do that you don't even know how to actually bring it up to god and that's one of the reasons why we stopped even doing surveys. But like, I, we can't do surveys because people can't identify specifically what they're talking about. But once you understand, you're like, yes, it's that thing. It's the colonial mentality and how it impacts me this way. And you're like, oh, okay. So that's impacted my life in this way. And when I think about my kid, like for example, I, I had a friend at, in college and I was like, oh, your daughter's kind of dark. Like, it's really interesting. You know, she kind of tans, tans, she goes, tans a little easier and she goes, no, she's not. I was like, I mean, she tans easier. I don't know what the big deal is. She goes, no, she's not dark. And I was like, whoa, there's something going on here. And of course, because this idea of being dark in certain parts of the country, like India with the colonial influence or Philippines, being dark is really bad, right? You want to be light. Uh, and to some degree, it's almost like black culture, right? In terms of like lightness and stuff like that. So that's part of what's happening. And the question is, does this have something to do with God? And I'm saying, of course, it's part of who you are, right? That's what I'm trying to say. So how do you learn that history? And they realize, oh, I need to kind of read some resources here. Yeah, because simply kind of saying, well, this is not an issue. What I'm saying is that a lot of times we think, here are the biblical issues of discipleship. And here are just, I don't know, random stuff. <laughs> and I'm like, that random stuff has to be connected to your discipleship. Otherwise, what's going to happen to that? How is it going to be transformed? That's part of the idea. Right? Yeah, like, you know, certain movie stars are lot, very light skinned. In certain places, I mean, they have, I was making fun of this thing. Fair and, uh, you know, uh, fair and beautiful, right? It's like this idea of like light skin cream. Like it's like a few multi billion dollar industry over in India because people want to be light. And there's a historical basis of that, right? And, and that actually has implications about how we think about beauty, how we think about ourselves, how we think about our, our uh, you know, acceptance, acceptance of ourselves. Let me see here. Uh, it's, it seems that we don't have depth in history, so we only have caricatures of media to hold on to, or rather turn away. Yeah, I mean, just, so it's me just a lot of times recovering history. There's actually so much stuff written. And I, I mean, Sylvia might know because she actually taken some classes in Asian American studies. There's actually so much Asian American studies. It's been around for 50 years. It's just that very few of us are interacting with it or learning from it. So we just don't even know how much we don't know. And once you realize, wow, like what I've experienced, that's a thing. It is not like, it's not just me. It's actually a historical thing. Like a lot of people have experienced this over time. And the question is, so what does this mean? Like, I mean, if it's a painful thing, then you can once again name it and, and, and you know, offer it to God. Because now we can actually name something, right? And I think part of the thing that I say is that it's interesting the fact that Jesus, um, names a demon before he casts it out. I'm like, why does it matter? What is your name? I'm like, who cares? Just cast it out. She's like, no, no, what is your name? Because naming has to do with control and authority over something. One of the reasons I, why I talk about language and naming stuff is because the question is, do you know what the thing is 
And then you start saying, well, how do I offer this to God? Because if you, if you can't name it, you have no idea what this thing is. You kind of fly blind. And that's a very painful experience. Can I, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I, I think I, I resonate a little bit with you in terms of like, um, I think um, we, we go through life not really are always like it's like fish in the water we're not always realizing our own context right so i think my i guess my question for you is you were saying you you didn't come to asian studies through a very formal educational settings right you're right, saying right. that in, in your life you, you you like things started you're starting recognizing recognizing things and you putting it together right. i'm just wondering if you could share a little bit more specifically on that because i think i think for me it's like okay I, um I came here when I, was, I came from Taiwan from when I was twelve. Yeah, so yeah. I think for me, once I got here, it's it's just survival mode, right? Like you right, just right. trying to make friends, uh, trying to go to school, try to learn a language, try to pick up the culture. So you don't really have the time to kind of be that self-aware, right? So I'm just wondering, like you know, like even now, right? Like going to work, going to church, leading Bible studies. Um, it just seems like racial identity don't don't really come in, right? Yeah. So I'm just wondering, like, what's your journey that really, like, like made you so interested in the Asian identity? And what, what are things that kind of, like, really clicked for you that you're just like, oh, that, no, that piece of information really yeah. changed my view of, you know, my relationship with God or the way I see church or, right. you know, that, yeah. Let me, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you this chapter that I, the two chapters that I wrote, right? Uh, from this book called how to it's actually not that complicated but it's because it's actually meant to be for college students it's about how do we interact with god right and how does it matter and also how do we interact with our parents and how do we think about our parents so there's two chapters and so i'll make sure i send it over to you chris and you can kind of read over it i mean if you you know you can kind of at least skim over it to see what we're talking about right um i one of the reasons why i was attracted to tim keller was because i was like well there's this i felt like asian american culture uh, was was really struggling with like kind of authoritarianism and kind of you know uh, uh, kind of legalism in a sense like moralism like reduction of the gospel but kind of like obedience right and I was like there's something here like I don't know if I really like God I mean no like I talk about the difference between like love and like right and actually I mean to some degree you can be like I love God uh, like I love my dad. And I love my dad, but I don't like him very much. I, I don't want to hang out with him, right? And I'm like, wait a minute. So you love your dad, but of course everybody has to love their dad. But I wouldn't like want to hang out with my dad. And I was like, wait a minute, what if you love God that way? <laughs> what if you love God that way? I love God, but I don't want to hang out with God because I don't really like God that much. And I was like, oh, that's a really bizarre idea because because when you get to heaven, the definition of heaven is the fact that you're going to be in like, you know, spending the time with God forever. And I, I t so I was at a retreat and I said, hey, uh, what if, uh, what if uh, God is like your dad and you're stuck in a room with him forever, for all eternity, one room forever, all eternity. That's basically what heaven is. He's like, pastor, I'll, I'll tell you right now, man. I mean, I, lo I love my dad and all, but that would be hell. And I was like, wait a minute. But how you see God is sometimes very closely related to how you see your dad. So is God that good? I mean, I'm trying to, as a pastor, trying to make you pray and read the Bible. I'm just telling you sometimes, you say you love God, but I'm not sure if you like God very much. So something happening over here culturally, right? That, that's really not, not helping you to understand deeply what's happening. And so that's basically, that's just one example, right? I'm, so I think that's basically, I'm trying to figure this out. Like I'm trying to go going down the rabbit hole and saying, what is happening? What is the problem here? I thought the problem for the longest time was just my Asian culture. And it turns out that it's not that because I can't get rid of my Asian culture. The question is, how do you, how do you understand what the problem is? Uh, I'll give you two concrete examples. One is marriage. I was like, when I got married, I was like, oh, because I was running away from the Asian church. I was like, okay, I'm gone. What I realized is that in my marriage, all the past impacts who I am. So the question is, how does gospel impact my marriage? And I realized a lot of the books that are written they're not talking about marriage and family relationships in the way that I think about it, right? How I experience them. Because it's actually more of like white experience, which is everybody's individual. And I'm like, it's not like that for me. 
So is something wrong with my family, right? Or is, are they talking about a different experience altogether? If you accept the fact that something's wrong with you, then you're accepting that perspective upon the world, which is actually describing, describing right? something else kind of like pathological, like something's wrong with you. But if you don't accept that and saying, well, that's actually one perspective, there are other experiences. Then the question is, how do I change my marriage so it actually becomes more healing, more helpful, more, 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 of, a, more of a godly thing, right? So that's one example. I think another example is when I started this job, um, I didn't think that race mattered. I was like, you know, culture is a problem. We have to kind of figure this out, right? Because culture, and I'm just trying to figure out how to, once again, lead, lead to deeper transformation of discipleship. Because this whole thing is really about how do we transform deeply, right? Um, I realized after a while, I was like, man, I hate this job. Why does it seem so painful? And I realized this. I realized growing up, I, I, I worked as an engineer for a couple of years. I realized that just in general, when I walk into a room or meeting, I don't always bring up the fact that I'm Asian American. I kind of just, I, I would say I almost leave it at the door. I'm like, I don't actually talk about it. Because <laughs> you don't know what the other person is going to say if you talk about Asian American this. And then, you know, even in like metropolitan places, there's some people who say, who, take, who just say really crazy stuff like, oh, you're Asian American, you're Korean American. I've been to Korea. I'm like, I haven't been to Korea. I, why are you talking about that? Oh, like, you know, hey, uh, you know, Dave, you, you're from China? Oh, yeah. I, you know, I like Chinese food. I like sushi. I'm like, I didn't stay on Japanese. Like, why are you bringing all this random stuff, right? What I realized is that I was getting so much of that. I was like, what is going on? It's so painful. And I realized because my job was officially Asian American, every single meeting I had to bring up Asian American stuff and people had to respond in a way to Asian American stuff. Like people were saying the craziest stuff. Like, they're like, oh, I like sushi. I'm like, why are we talking about food? Like I'm talking about like Asian American theology. Like there's just so much random stuff. And I realized that has a name. It's called microaggressions. And it's been something that a lot of people experience. It's just that we try to navigate it so that we don't have to experience it. I think we do it naturally. It's just that because of my job, I can't not talk about Asian Americanness. So I was getting, every, I was like a microaggressive magnet. Like people are like just giving it to me, right? Microaggressions are like everyday racism. If you don't know about it, it's like, it's like paper cuts. It's very subtle. It's just like, oh, just slight things, right? But what people say is that after a while, it builds up, right? It builds up and does something toxic to your body. And, and you, you, you think about the world, you navigate the world very differently. And we can do this even, even in our faith. You can be like, hey, what, what, you know, what part, uh, what, what kind of message do I hear? And what part of I, who I am uh, uh, gets transformed by the gospel? And what parts, I don't know how to connect the gospel to this part here. And what I'm trying to do is make sure that all of who we are are transformed. And we realize that I can kind of bring this side, bring this side. Uh, what I'm saying is the standard one size fits all doesn't necessarily help us, right? Because it's actually more of like a white suburban normative kind of, uh, kind of understanding. Uh, yeah, I hope, I hope that kind of makes, um, yeah, that kind of gives you some sense of what I'm talking about. That's been my journey is realizing, okay, I don't really have words to describe what my experience is. And I think, oh, that's, that's like a not important, but I realize these little experiences that I have and who I am actually matters a lot. And I really want all these things to be transformed because I want these healing, I want the transformation, and I want to bring all the, all the best gifts that I can have for God's kingdom. And just everyday life, whether it be parenting or dealing with our parents or even marriage or, or even like, you know, work life. You know, like a lot of Asian Americans after a while realize we don't get promoted. Like, it's actually like a common thing, right? It's part of the bamboo ceiling. And, and after a while, when you become middle life, you know, middle, like middle age, that's when you start experiencing it. It's not when you're younger you might get move up easier, but actually when you become like middle-aged and you should be going up to like manager level, that doesn't necessarily happen. And there's a long history to something like that. It's not just you when something like that happens. Thoughts, reflections. I mean, I think some things, I realized now, I was like, no, some of the things I've talked about might be a bit more abstract. So I'm trying to figure out exactly like how how it kind of comes down to where you are. So, uh, 
Yeah, w one question is like, what's the difference between like, um, I mean, some of the things I'm talking about kind of overlaps with like Hispanics or, or even like, you know, historically like German immigrants or whatever. It's just that when these things kind of intersect all together, like Asian heritage along with our immigration and along with our skin color, then you end up having a very unique experience to who you are. You have a very unique experience. And what does it mean to, uh, to once again, submit ourselves and be transformed in that? Or what are the things that are uh, part of the gospel that we want to kind of have to think about more? In terms of like, once again, what does it mean the fact that God's our father? I would say, like I generally tell people, like it's not like, it can't be like a passing comment. Like, oh yeah, God's our father. I'm like, no, no, you might need to kind of unpack that for like a couple of weeks, right? And what is God's mother? What, is it, what does fatherhood mean? Because that's, it's, it's an area that's actually more fraught, right? Whereas some other people are like, oh, I get, I get what you're talking about. And so that's basically how we would think about it more, right? But when we talk about discipleship, for example, like, so, so I gave you the idea of Tim Keller's examples, like here are a bunch of examples. And I'm like, his, his gospel for your life or whatever, it doesn't include family. And I'm like, well, family is such a huge part of who we are. What is family? And it's not there because they're thinking about it purely individualistically, but a lot of our lives aren't like that. We actually have to interact with family. And so if the family doesn't change, the question is how do you change as a person, right? How, what, is it, what do you do with that part of our discipleship? Or once again, racial minorities. Yeah. Wait a we have, how long do we have? Chris? Oh, you're muted. Uh, okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, it's got like 20 minutes. Yeah, so anyways, the reason why I talk about this thing, and then I'll talk about it next week, why knowing about Asian American history and even history of activism helps you understand what to do with Black Lives Matter. Like, why is it even that important at all? Because when you realize the fact that Asian American history, when you know about it, it's, it's very, very, that more closer to Black experience, especially before the 50s, then, and, and even modern minority, the fact that we experience, like the fact that, oh, most of us are pretty well educated or whatever, that actually is a bit complicated idea and not just like, you know, so it's not like we're all like basically pseudo white people. We act, it's actually a bit more complicated than that, right? And we're seeing it right now with all the, you know, and I mean, anti-COVID racism, like anti-Asian COVID racism, like what the heck is Yeah. That? I don't know. Hey, hey Gordon, you might want to mute. <laughs> uh, um, open, hi, open hi Daniel. Hey, I, have a, I have a question. This yep. is Beverly. Well, not a question, but um, I guess, can you help me or speak to like, um, just thinking about race and then history and activism and things, I get angry and, or I feel very divided. Like there's just a, a, a spirit of like anger or division, you know, within myself and between races, you know, and I, and I know the answer is like love and the gospel and grace, but like, what are, I don't know, can you speak more to that? Oh, Cause I, I don't want, you know, to be feeling from anger, you know, or like, this is an injustice, this is an injustice, which it is. Yeah, but, I would say this. I mean, that's you a know, really good point. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Are you done? No, no, that's it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, <laughs> when you learn about history and you realize, oh my gosh, that's terrible, uh, the natural reaction is anger, like in pain, and it should be. Like, I mean, like, why would it not? That's a human experience, right? You, we, I mean, I think people don't realize the fact that the natural like, and godly experience of injustice should be anger, right? Now, what I would say is that how do you work through that? Because leading out of that is not the best thing to do. And also, I tell people, because usually when I teach people all the history and all the cultural aspects of it, I mean, they're like, they realize, oh my gosh, there's so much like, like racism that we kind of encounter. And the question is, do you want to know? Well, if you don't know, then you'll just be part of the system that kind of, and, and our families will, and our kids will kind of keep on experiencing the same thing. But if you don't fight it, I tell people, I keep on going, work through the anger, work through the pain and get to the other side of it. And then you can kind of figure out, okay, now what do we do? Like, what, are the, what are the tools and what, how do we navigate this thing? Um, the idea, that there's, a, there's a previous idea, and uh, this is basically why people don't talk about racial reconciliation anymore. Previously, 
the idea of racial reconciliation was built upon multiculturalism, which basically said everybody's experience, let's just get along, right? Hey, you know, black people don't like black, white people, white people don't like black people. Why don't you just understand each other, get along? That way of thinking about it, people don't use it anymore. The reason why is because it was ahistorical. Like it didn't, it, it kind of didn't acknowledge the fact that this, that this is a historical and structural dimension. What's that? People are mad at white people, so why don't, why don't you just love white people? It ended up being that way instead of saying, what is really happening and what's the history behind this thing and what's lingering in our society? So that's why people don't talk about racial reconciliation as much as people talk about racial justice now. Unless you fix what the problem is, it's very hard. It's not like people are, it's not, it's not like everybody's at like equal playing ground and we're just trying to get together. It's like the, the playing ground is absolutely uneven. And for Asian Americans to be part of it, we have to know where we are. Like there was a, so I talked to people around the country and, and UT Austin, it turns out, you know, University of Texas Austin, it turns out the Asian American fellowship, uh, Christian fellowship is one of the biggest student groups, flat, like this is all across on campus. And the, one of the leaders was like, well, you know what? You would think we would be a really important, uh, uh, we can play an important role because we're literally the biggest campus ministry on back campus group, not campus ministry, campus group on, you know, at, at UT Austin. And I was like, well, you can't really play a role because you don't know who you are. You don't actually know where you fit into the picture. So how would you play a role? Right? And so that's basically what we're talking about. And we don't even know exactly particularly where we've come from historically or in terms of, uh, so it's hard to play a particular role because we don't actually know uh, we don't know, uh, once again, how we fit into this problem altogether. And actually, there is an answer, right? There's historically an answer in terms of how we play a role. And within that answer, there's actually a wide range of how, what that can look like. So that's actually more in terms of racial justice. I'll talk more about this thing in terms of how our experience looks like as opposed to black, white, and, and what that, you know, specifically in terms of racial justice next week. I'm just talking about generally the fact that we have different kind of experiences and the fact that uh, instead of saying, uh, our identity is kind of just Christian idea is all that matters and our human ideas don't matter. I'm basically saying all aspects of who we are are redeemed and transformed in Christ. Not like just, uh, not just, uh, I don't know, spiritual identity. And once you get that, then you can kind of try to figure out how do we, uh, how do we kind of, uh, you know, uh, offer this to God and how do we, how do we be healed of this particular thing? Any thoughts, questions? Uh, Hi, this is Alex. Now, I have a question. Um, so my question is... Are you on uh, the video or just, is this audio? Am I going crazy? Am I not seeing you? It's just audio, right? Only. Yeah, it's just the okay. audio. Um, I, I took a nap before this and uh, I don't look okay. great. So good, good. <laughs> spare you That's guys fine. the horror. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so my question is, uh, do, you think the, do you think Asian Americans um, identify more with an aspect of the gospel slash... Uh, Christian theology, because um, like one example that comes to my mind is um, like African Americans and like the um, of the Pentecostal tradition. Um, I think I've only, again, like my experience um, with that population and in that church is limited. But um, I think there's this kind of like idea that their church kind of focuses more on like Exodus, the idea of liberating themselves. Yeah, and I'm yeah. thinking that, you know, it's great to, you know, that is one aspect of the gospel and it's very important. Right. Um, I'm thinking like, is it possible that, you know, resonating so much with this one aspect of theology can skew the overall meaning if you're holding this one aspect of the Bible to maybe greater importance than what it is? And I'm wondering, like, do you think that Asian Americans have this sort of theology that they hold or resonate with more? And does yeah. this like, shift our understanding of like the gospel? I, I would say a lot of Asian Americans, we just take whatever the most popular white pastor is, and we adopt that. I don't think we, and it's not the fact that it's not helpful. Like I always tell people, all the stuff, it, it overlaps with our experience in a particular way. It just doesn't talk about all of our experience. It's like a leftover that it doesn't touch, right? It doesn't kind of impact that side. It only impacts like certain aspects of our experience. I mean, if you can see my video. So, that's basically what generally Asian Americans, Christians in general, and Asian American churches do. 
I think a lot of Asian American churches don't realize the fact that they're Asian American churches, which is actually very hard. For example, like as a community in this church, there are particular pastoral issues that are there, right? And so you would think that, you know, because you think about the black church and you're like, man, how is the black church making a huge contribution? Yeah, yeah once again, how, how is the black church making a huge contribution in their own particular way, right? Well, Asian Americans, if we kind of own more particularly where we are, we would actually be able to kind of make our own contributions in a sense, as we're trying to figure out where is God in the midst of our particular struggles. Um, that's basically, yeah, we, we adopt white, white theology because we're like, well, aren't we just white? Because our educational system is white. And I'm like, oh, it does help us a lot, but there's this other extra that we don't know what, what this thing is. And we do need help with this thing. And it's basically, so once again, one example is like, for example, like what are we, like our family relationships, like this is one example, like our family relationships matter a lot. And we actually might need more loose resources in that regard. But if we just take typical, because I'm a seminary professor, right? So family is not something that seminaries care about that much, unless you actually take a class. Systemic theology, because I teach systemic theology, family not even included. Like typical pastor who do an MDiv, like you know, go to a seminary, might not know anything about family. Now, that's odd, because family experience is actually really important. I mean, I don't know if Chris was there when Ray Anderson was there, because he was one of the very, very few professors who actually talked about family, who actually wrote books on family, right? But a lot of people don't. And the question is, why not? It's there in the Bible, it's there in our lives, but it's not in theology. And what I'm saying is this is not neutral. It's actually skewed from a particular perspective. And if we thought about that, if we thought about our experience, we might be like, no, this actually causes me pain. This actually, I, I worry about this thing. I don't know what to do with it. And I would say we need more spiritual resources for that area. That's why this book called, I am actually kind of old. I think it was almost like, what, almost 20 years old. It's called, a, like, you know, discipleship book for like um, uh, Asian American college student. It was called Following Jesus Without Dishonoring Your Parents. Because they knew that there was a tension, right? And the book is, you know, there's good aspects of it. There are aspects of it that I kind of, I think it's, it's definitely dated. And I think my chapter on parents that I'm going to send you <laughs> kind of addresses those things. Like, what do you do with this thing? There are particular things that we experience that I think we need resources for. Um, yeah, I think we were trying to kind of have a whole understanding of scripture, but just like how the black church focuses on Exodus, I think there might be part of the Bible that we might want to think about. Well, here's something here, because it's not like how, Western, you know, white theology, it's not, that's not neutral either. It's not like that's, that's like generic and neutral and one size fits all and just totally even. They actually definitely emphasize certain things and other things. And like once again, family is one example of that. And which I think immediately it impacts us on an everyday basis. And it's just, it's just not there. It's the research just isn't there for us. Um, or even race, right? In terms of what that looks like. Because, um, you know, if you're, if you're white, like, well, is race important? For black people, I'm like, well, that's every day. How do you, what do, you, what do, what do I do with this thing, right? I mean, even if you don't want it to be a big part, it just is. So the question is, what do I do with this thing? So you need theological, spiritual resources for these things, for discipleship and for worship. And like, how do I bring this to God? Because if I can't, then how will this be transformed? Um, does human experience of shame blind us to areas of faith? I like family de-emphasize. Yeah, I think shame is actually an important part. But if you, um, I would say, some people say, well, look, it's about shame. Like, you know, Asian culture is shame culture. So it's not like the guilt culture. I think that's actually a bit too stereotypical. I think it's, it, it, it's reductive. Shame that definitely plays a part, but to say shame culture, and I can go over this whole thing about history of calling something shame culture, is actually a long racist history of calling Asia shame culture. So, and which is not, actually not very helpful, even though shame is a big part of who we are, right? So. Um, it's just, you want to think about multiple facts, you know, aspects of it, not just shame. Because I would say race plays a huge part. For example, I'm going to talk about next week, the fact that Asian Americans say, oh, you know, we don't, we're, I mean, some people, who, if any of you who actually are part of like, you know, act, uh, political activism, you might be like, look, Asian Americans are all complicit, we're all silent, and it's our fault. And I tell people, uh, or they say, you know, it's because of our culture, our culture makes us silent. And I tell them, well, first of all, like we're just erased from the race conversation altogether and our history is erased. So it's hard to be a part of any conversation if you're erased, 
Like, how do you be part of the conversation? I have no idea how to even enter it. So that's basically where our state is. At that point, it's not very helpful to blame ourselves because we're erased, and we're not the one erasing ourselves. And second of all, uh, for us to be part of it, you would have to learn. And I mean, the idea of this idea of the fact that Asian, Asian culture makes us silent, like the whole, you know, people always say, well, nail that six seconds, hammer down. I'm like, that's not an Asian value because if you, if you know Asian history, like people in Asia protest. I don't know if I as much, but it turns out if you look at Asian American history, people protest it too. So we have a particular lens of what we think Asianness is, Asian Americanness, but it's actually not true. It's more like what, what every media kind of tells us we are. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about that more later next week because we're talking about Black Lives, you know, like the whole Black Lives and protests. But once again, it's, if you can understand ourselves and try to start filling in the holes, then you'll be understanding like, like this is what's going on. Uh, can you dig a little more deep about regional differences of Asian Americanness and what imp implication might be? If you're a certain part of the country, um, like if you're in California, for example, there's so many Asian Americans, right? So people are just more comfortable. Like you see like Asian American, like, you know, politicians and they're vocal. I mean, Asian Americans are everywhere, right? On TV. So how do you think about your Asian Americanness? You just, you just take up more room. You're like, oh, I can just be Asian American. I'm not ashamed of, it, ashamed of it, right? And you can do that to some degree, but SoCal is so big and Asian Americans are everywhere, right? So you think about your Asian American as very differently. If you're like, let's say in Minnesota, and actually Minnesota is not an example because there are still a lot of Asian Americans. Well, actually, and I'll give you this example. Like Roy Choi is a chef in LA and he's a book called LA Sun. He's like, I'm LA Sun, right? I can represent LA. I can be an ambassador for LA. Like all of LA, not Asian American LA, just LA. Because LA does say, oh, Korean barbecue is LA food. Now, the question is, is that like that in different parts of the country? It is not, even though there might be a lot of Asian Americans. Like, it's, you're, you're still invisible. Like, in Asian Americans in SoCal, you're just so visible and it's just there, it's actually a lot easier to kind of think about it. But if you're like in the middle of Kansas and you're like one Asian American, I mean, you're gonna really pathologize. You're gonna really think about your Asian Americanness as something you don't want at all. Right, and that becomes part of how you think about yourself. Or if you're like in the, you know Atlanta, the black and white binary is so strong. Asian Americans have to figure out where they fit and where they decide. So those are part of the ways in which we, we kind of uh, regional differences kind of matter. And it matters because when you're, I mean, when you're going to school, when you're working, I mean, all these forces are there. It's invisible because you're like fish in water, but it's definitely happening to you. Whether you like it or not, it's happening to you. And the question is, how do you make sense of it, right? How do you make sense of it? And what's the wise thing to do? Because if you don't even see what's happening, you'll just be blindsided on a regular basis. And you have no idea why something's happening. So I'm trying to give you language to say, when that happens, that's what that is. Like, oh, it just happened to you. And that's not a good thing, right? I'll send you the article. I mean, if you want to read it, you could kind of skim over the microaggression part of it. And that, that'll be kind of helpful to talk about what Asian American microaggressions are, microaggressions are, and the fact that these are paper cut kind of things that can be even said by a well-meaning person that can do significant damage over time because it accumulates. And after a while, it kind of ends up being like, you're covered in like paper cuts. It's like a death by paper cuts. And then you become more sensitive to certain things or you hide certain parts of you because you're like, oh, well, this part of myself in this context is not presentable. So I'm not going to mention the fact that I like dim sum because in this context with this group, if I mention dim sum, they're going to say, do you eat dog? And I'm like, dim sum and dog, I, how did you get there? But in this context, it's not safe. Whereas in this context, it's perfectly fine. We navigate these spaces. I'm saying if there's too many of these spaces, you're not going to bring up these as other aspects of who I am, who you are, right? And I'm trying to say all aspects of who you are have to come to Christ because we want all of that to be transformed. I'll kind of end with this story. <clears throat> David Chang, Chef David Chang, right? I mean, top of his game, right? You know, uh, James Beard Award, you know, Mission and Star. Incredibly influential, right? I mean, the fact that we have ramen restaurants, like in the middle of Kentucky, right? It's because of David Chang, right? Because he made it so popular. <laughs> they do have chicken feet, yes, they do. So, <clears throat> Uh, what's interesting about David Chang is the fact that he 
kind of owns his Asian Americans in a particular way. And he's able to do something really incredibly innovative. Or was something like, you know, Viet Nguyen. Like writers and chefs are some of the most innovative and creative Asian Americans out there. I think when you see people in ministry, Asian Americans can't figure out how to contribute to the society or our neighborhood, make an impact, because we're, we don't know what it means to be Asian American. Whereas these famous Asian Americans who are making an impact in the world, in their field, are connecting with who they are and using all of their, who they are for, for their work. And I'm saying, what does it mean to use all of who you are for God's kingdom, right? For your neighborhood. Like, what does that really mean to do that? And so that's basically why knowing yourself really matters a lot. It's a long journey. All right. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I think uh, we have to wrap up now, right, Chris? I mean, if, if uh, people do have other questions, um, yeah, I, I can conversation stick on going for a few minutes if you want to. Yeah, I can stick on that a little bit. And, um, you know, if you have questions, I mean, once again, I'm trying to, like, help you see something. And then, once again, next week, it'll be very concrete because we're talking about um, racism and how, it, how all of us experience race. But I'll, I'll send you those two articles to Chris if you want to skim over and see what we're talking about, uh, which has to do with like how we pray and how we interact with God and also how we, uh, how we interact with parents, for example, or how, even how we parent. And then the second thing is uh, that microaggression article in terms of how a lot of times Asian American experience racism, like just very subtle on an everyday basis and how that impacts us. So I'll, I'll send you those things. And if you want to skim over it, that's perfectly fine. If you don't, then I'll... You know, <laughs> I, I, I'll talk. Of, I, I, yeah, we can talk about it next week. I mean, you can always email me if you have any specific questions as well. Yeah. Questions, thoughts. I, I'm, I'm. You know, we can c go on for a little more. Um, I think if, if like people have just one or two more questions, uh, we can bring them up. If not, we'll just close in prayer. Um, I also like after the the session's over. I think we could keep the Zoom line open a little bit if you just want to have some informal conversation, you know, after we close the session up to just with our community if we want to as well. So, um, but yeah, any other, just uh, one or two more questions if people have them just to. It can be questions of thoughts as well. Like, oh, I'm just trying to process things and see, see what this means. So that can be just a short comment as well. I think when, when you mention like a uh, famous like comedian, um, like writers and chefs, like I think what resonated with me is I think recently there's with, with Netflix and, um, and, and Amazon, there's a lot of Asian American comedians. Right, right. Um, yeah, and I think they, they do speak a lot of voice into our Asian American identity that's rarely seen. And I think comedians are, you know, in some ways are kind of, very strong cultural observers, you know. Right. So. And truth tellers in a sense, right? Because it's like yeah. seeing yeah. truth, like, oh, that is true. Like, it is ah, like the fact that it's like this. Yeah, I mean, the committees are one. I mean, there's different people are doing it. And I guess the idea is the fact that they're running on, they're running on four cylinders. All, all of who they are, they're functioning, right? They're not trying to be like, oh, they're, they're not trying to be pseudo white. And I'm saying there's something about that in terms of what kind of, whatever work you do, what does it mean to bring all of who you are? So you can do that work well, right? I mean, not only just Christian, but just basically whatever work you do. Um, it's just, it's very difficult to do that unless we learn how to do that because that's not, that's not part of our educational system. I think, um, am I on? Yeah, okay. Uh, one thing that might be helpful for people as we close, just to think about how we can apply this uh, to our faith in, in kind of practical ways. Like we think about, our, our identity, our backgrounds, like how do we, and we look at, and, and you mentioned multiple times about bringing our whole lives to Christ. How can we incorporate that kind of on a daily basis as we are seeking to kind of grow in our faith and also live in the world around us? Yeah, generally I tell people what hurts. Like sometimes things hurt. We have, we have questions like, how does this connect? And, and to dig that deeper, like how does it connect as particularly part, why do you ask that question? Who are you? And what is your life experience that, that, that kind of, and then you kind of start filtering through that. Yeah, filtering through that and kind of figuring out well, what is really happening here? I think it's part of what we're trying to do.
I mean, so I, I'll tell you this story and then I'll kind of wrap up. Like I was invited to speak at, uh, at, at Redeemer Jersey. At the time, it was like, Redeemer Jersey was like a church plant. And actually, it was supposed to be multi-ethnic. But the Asian, the young adult ministry, which I was invited to, was pretty much all Asian American. And I said, all right, I'm going to come and talk about community. He's like, well, I think we know about community. I'm not sure if it's important. So I was like, well, let me tell you what community looks like. So I came and talked about, you know, talked about community life and what does it mean to be, have authentic community and stuff like that. And, and like, people were like weeping. And I was like, what the heck's happening? I mean, you, I mean, it, 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 you just, I was preaching. It's like, it's, I was like, wait a minute. The preaching is actually addressing certain parts of who they are, but there's other really, really like painful experiences it's not connecting to. And I'm like, well, what happens to that side of who you are, right? I mean, where is the healing for that? Whether we're talking about just, you know, interaction with our parents or whether we just, just the particular struggles of kind of a, our, our particular experience of a disconnection, because relationships matter a lot for Asian Americans. I mean, just in general, in different ways. So I think the question is, I was like, that's really bizarre. Like, and I think that, that really kind of impacted me significantly. I was like, well, what if there are so such deep pains and there's no way that we're, we're connecting to those things, right? And I'm saying, like, God sees that and it matters. And sometimes when you read some of these things, it might kind of address it, but there, maybe there's a way to kind of address that fully directly and be like, oh, yes, that is my pain. And God's saying, I care about that. Uh, that's basically one of the things that kind of converted me and I realized, oh, that's basically what all theologians are doing. They're actually de dealing with the pains and struggles of their community. And that's what I'm trying to do. Like, I'm trying to figure out how to address and talk about the pains of that community, right? So, uh, and th th like the idea of kind of loving and liking God, I'm like, that's a really interesting point because it's really bizarre, right? What other questions you, you find effective? What hurts? Um, like, if you feel like, well, you know, what, what part of like, what part of scripture, what, what part of who God is, you find problematic or like you love, right? There might be a reason why you like that part, good or bad. It might be poor problem, make the fact that you like it. For example, I grew up thinking that people, people that Proverbs was, was one of the most important books. I'm like, why well, was Proverbs one of the most important books? I'm not get, I get like Galatians or like Romans. Proverbs? It's a really interesting idea. Like, why is it so important? Why was it so important growing up in my church experience? And so the question is, like, Let's kind of unpack that a little bit. Why is that so? So if there's certain aspects of how you grew up, but you have to start seeing it, right? Like, why is it so? You have to kind of have some self-reflection of like, why did I grow up this way? And why, what was my spirituality emphasizing this way? This is how I thought about God. I'll share the articles with you so you kind of have an idea what that looks like if you want to skim over it a little bit. Um, and then you can kind of see it. Well, great. Well, thank you so much uh, for uh, spending this time with us. It's just so, I'm sure, just for all of us, insightful and, and really helpful, thought-provoking. Um, and, and everybody, remember, next week we are going to be continuing this conversation. So uh, same time, same place, same Zoom, uh, and we'll be there. And uh, yeah, and uh, Dr. Lee, would you, uh, would you like to close us in prayer? Yeah. Uh, gracious God, as we continue on our journeys, um, God, we just stir up um, our, our, our thoughts, stir up our minds. Um, would you search us as you know, know us so well in the ways that, uh, in the ways that you want to heal us, that you want to transform us, and you want to use all of who we are for kingdom work. Um, we're just starting kind of this journey, <laughs> at least here and, and talking about these things. Um, would your spirit kind of uh, bring things to light? Uh, we pray for uh, community, this community here. Uh, we pray that you'll continue to kind of uh, watch over it. And uh, um, we we'll just thank you for this time. Pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Right, well, hopefully we can continue on and, and things are kind of settled in and make more sense. If, if you're confused about it, I'll send you the articles and you can kind of read about it if you, if you want to skim over and see. Yeah, and I'll, I'll send them to all of you as well. And then, um, yeah, next week, I guess if you have other questions, you can save them for next week too. And 
and Dr. Lee can uh, address them as well. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we'll just keep this channel open for a little bit. So, uh, you know, at this point, you're welcome to log off or uh, stay on chat for a little bit if you like. Great. I'll send the stuff over and uh, I look forward to continuing conversation next week. So it's like part one and two. So I guess you'll have a better understanding of what we're talking about next week. too. Uh, I'll Great. think about your, some of your questions and see if I can include it next week. Great. Okay. Bye. God bless y'all. Thank you.